Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Cloud Wars Live. Thanks for being here for this special episode of our podcast, where it's part of our CEO Cloud Outlook 2021 series, and where we're speaking with the top executives from some of the leading cloud vendors in the world. Today, we're delighted to have Thomas Curing, the CEO of Google Cloud, with us. Thomas, a year ago, was the winner of our CEO of the Year Award. And also in 2020, Thomas has had another spectacular year leading Google Cloud to be the hottest cloud company in the world with growth over 45% in Q4 and lots more good things coming up in 2021, which Thomas will share with us in this upcoming episode. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Cloud Wars, where we are speaking with some of the leaders of the digital revolution, the CEOs of some of the top technology companies in the world who are bringing the cloud to the forefront of the business revolution that's taking place and allowing massive changes in every part of our lives. We're thrilled today to be speaking with the CEO of Google Cloud, Thomas Curian. Thomas, welcome. It's always a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you so much, Bob, for having me. It's good to see you again. Yeah, and I know, Thomas, it was, uh, it was just about exactly a year ago we had a chance to speak out at Google headquarters uh, is the recognition for you of being the CEO of the year for Cloud Wars. And uh, it was, you, I'm sure you were expecting a pretty lively year then in December of 2019, but no one could have expected a year like we've all had to deal with. Oh, no. I, I think if he, if somebody had said, you know, the that the whole world would be working remotely this year, and uh, sheltering in place, you know, it's a testament to the human spirit that when something like the pandemic happens, people find magically a way to, you know, to adapt and persevere and have hope despite what's obviously been such a complicated year for everybody. Thomas, it's interesting how you express that because it goes back, I think, to at the end of the keynote you gave um, at, uh, you know, your event this year for Google Cloud, and you spoke about that sense of optimism and what's possible. And then you see we've got a vaccine developed in nine months, which, again, it, it, the testament to the human spirit. It, it's remarkable. Yes, I mean, it's, uh, it's remarkable the way that, you know, first line, front line workers like nurses and doctors, my wife's a doctor, they continue to take care of patients despite all the anxiety people have about whether they would get ill. Um, there's so many people in so many different parts of the world who have really stepped up and then the ability to create a new vaccine in a, such a compressed period of time, it really, despite obviously it has been so challenging for so many families and people affected not just by the illness, but also job losses and impact on you know less um, developed parts of the world, et cetera. It's still a testament to what we can all accomplish uh, with the ingenuity that humans show. Thomas, you know, that it's so much a part of your first two years at Google Cloud have been working with companies to help them do things that they could not do before. So in the midst of all this, could you talk a little bit about what you see as sort of the, the macroeconomic climate and the role that technology is able to play here and the, the sense of innovation that, that companies are really latching onto? I mean, the couple of things that we see a lot, um, first is digitization. D digitization takes different lenses in different industries. In retail, it's the huge, huge growth in e-commerce. In uh, you know, medicine and healthcare, it's telemedicine. In financial services, digital banking. Um, and it's not just having that digital front door, but once you have that digital front door, a number of things have to change behind it. Very practical example. If you're a retailer um, or a restaurant or a, or a grocery store, demand planning is extraordinarily different because of e-commerce as opposed to when you were stocking goods in stores, right? Uh, the impact on supply chains. Supply chains are extremely fragile uh, because if you're dependent on a set of parts or products or components that came from a part of the world and you didn't have a second supplier and that part of the world got locked down, you have an issue. So this the, the process of digitization has sped up. There is enormous change happening in areas like supply chains uh, to provide greater optionality for people in the environment. Uh, obviously, there's a new way of working that we're all experiencing. 
and people want to ensure that employees feel connected and productive and creative in this new reality we're facing. Um, and there's also new technologies coming along. You know, 5G is an example that we see a lot of interest in, and we are working very closely with people. And then through it all, there's also in the long term, organizations want to plan for what the recovery would look like. And their view is the future is not going to look like the past. You know, there have been, because of the extended period of change that we've been through, um, there will be, you know, people will go back in some form, but it won't go back to the way things were. And so the, many companies are also trying to reinvent their own future, recognizing some of those secular changes. Thomas, if I could just go back a little bit in time, I think uh, you had started your, your career at McKinsey. And I, you know, then through your time with Oracle, now a couple of years at Google Cloud, it's just remarkable to observe over that time that the way that time itself has sort of been crunched. And so what companies used to be able to devote a year or two or three years to now it's it's months, right? Or even weeks. Yes. I mean, it's, it's amazing. I, I still remember we got a call from a major Canadian retailer and they told us, Mon you know, this is on a Friday. They said Monday morning you know, we're going to be not able to have physical stores open. We need to shift our business entirely online. And the volume they saw on that Monday in terms of the peak uh, was well above what they had ever experienced, including a Black Friday. And just imagining that you would see that kind of shift in a two-day period from a Friday to a Monday, uh, it's th the time compression is just remarkable. And Thomas, when these companies talk to you, how do they express their their hope or their aspiration for what you and Google Cloud might be able to do with them? It, you know, it's it's a lot of it is just looking at how they want to serve customers better in every industry and reimagining what that would look like. And there are many, many, some many of these things are not extraordinarily complicated, but they are simple things, but complex to get done. I'll give you an example. Um, you know, people have increasingly got comfortable scanning electronically their checks rather than having to go to the bank to deposit checks. Now, that's one of the primary reasons people went to the bank. But, you know, when they went to the bank, they also got a lot of other services. An example is advisory services on loans and mortgages, um, identity verification, which in many cases required a physical presence. Uh, there were many things you still needed to fill out paperwork for. Now, all those are going digital now. And so the changes people want is how do you bring the expertise that a bank advisor would have now done through a digital medium? And it's not about the mobile banking app because that's largely been about moving money and transacting. But how do you encapsulate everything that a financial institution could be and deliver that to a digital experience? And so that's the kind of thing that we're looking at is a lot of our work is helping companies reimagine how they can take the entire capability and service that they offer, but deliver it in a new way to people. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting the distinction you make there about it's not an app, but this is the reimagination of everything they have. That's right. That's right. And how do you bring mm -hmm. through a digital medium? You know, a lot of organizations distinguish themselves because they bring that notion of customer intimacy through their people. And how do you transform their people through a digital medium? You know, I'll give you a, a second example. If you can buy products, the same product from many different retailers, um, for example, electronic products, televisions, et cetera, how does a organization differentiate itself from the next one? And that is really about transforming the service experience. And when you look at that, um, it's about how quickly can you deliver it? How quickly can you get the person to be able to watch that first television show? Um, mm -hmm. how, and there's a lot of things behind that. How do you make sure you have the right inventory in the right places? How quick can you make fulfillment time changes? What do you do for demand forecasting so you can be more accurate with that? And it's linking all that using new tools, data, analytics, machine learning, to be able to predict and deliver a differentiated experience that we think is what a lot of people are asking us for 
and asking us for ways to help them. Thomas, can I ask you, you know, on that, you talked about the TV purchase, and I think it's been interesting to see, you know, maybe these things were happening um, in parallel, and I just didn't notice because I was more focused on looking at what was happening in the tech industry. But it seems like businesses outside the tech industry are taking the as-a-service model and trying to roll that forward. So could, um, could a TV manufacturer develop you know, TV as a service, right? So sign up for five years, you get a new TV every year and they own it. Do you see some things like that starting to emerge in the broader business community? We see a lot of it. You know, we see, for example, uh, we're working with a major financial institution uh, to help them build a new platform for securities. And ironically, the securities are really about capital goods. Capital goods are things like construction equipment and earth moving equipment. In the past, if you were a construction company, you paid for that as a capital purchase. Increasingly, they want it paid as a service. Now, once you pay that as a service, it becomes an annuity, and that annuity becomes a tradable financial instrument. So that's a, an example of what we see you know, in, in, in one place. If you look at media, you know, there's a lot of media companies increasingly offering, whether that's movies or audio or of books now rather than buying a book you buy a service and you can get uh, on the subscription as many books as you want to read so we see the as a service model coming to many many industries um, and a big part of our work is also not only facilitating that but also helping organizations who are in one industry use tools that are digital so an example bob is Pharmaceutical companies are amazing chemists. You know, their core competency is molecular, you know, chemistry. Uh, but to identify what's the best and most effective drug for a particular disease, you also have to simulate the chemistry of that drug. Like how will it be absorbed? How will it be, uh, you know, is it going to be toxic, et cetera, et cetera. And in the past, it required traditional you know, experiments, uh, going through clinical trials and all of that. And now there are digital tools that allow you to, you know, to simulate those things much more effectively. And we're working with a number of partners. And so the idea there is to bring a digital competency to an industry, to a platform, uh, to help it transform more quickly. Thomas, I saw the uh, CEO of GlaxoSmithKline speak recently, and she said that the role of digital technology and a digital business model, she says, is extended not just in the discovery process that you described, but she said how we manufacture things, how we source the materials that go into it, how we plan distribution. So this, this ripple effect that you first mentioned about digitization, it seems to be to almost to have like no end in sight for where it can be applied. Yeah, I mean, people in the pharmaceutical industry, as well as in other industries like consumer packaged goods, increasingly want to do track and trace. You know, if you're in the food business, you need to be able to track the food supply chain. And we're helping some of the largest, you know, food and consumer packaged goods manufacturers be able to have a more sustainable supply chain and be able to track from origin to delivery the impact of their component supply chain. If you're in pharmaceuticals or in other industries even, increasingly people want to do digital track and trace from the time a medicine was shipped to the time it's been consumed by a person, uh, the entire supply chain and where physical points of presence in which it's distributed. So that entire process, as you said, is, is now part of this whole digitization process that we see. Thomas, and that's a great example. I think in uh, February of this year, I believe you spoke at the Goldman Sachs Investors Conference, and I think it was Heather Bellini asked you the question about, you know, some people say Google Cloud's behind and, you know, they're, they're trailing some other competitors. I, I just loved your answer because you said, I think what people will want from cloud over the next two or three years will be very different from what they wanted today or the past two or three years. So could you talk a little bit about this sort of rolling and evolving requirement or expectation for what cloud technology can deliver? 
Yeah, cloud technology eventually, you know, the, what customers really want are solutions to problems that they have. And given the discussion we had on compression of time, the provider that gives them some the solutions that are easiest to adopt is the most important thing. Now, I'll just give you two examples that we see significantly um, in just as illustrations in two industries. You know, if you look at financial institutions, historically they looked at cloud technology as IT infrastructure to run their systems. And we certainly work with many, many leading banks to provide that. But increasingly they say, can you help me with some problems that I couldn't solve before? Can you give me a real time customer 360, the ability to see my customers and exactly what they need at any point in time, but in real time? Can you help me with you know, anti-money laundering and fraud detection? Because today that's an extraordinary complexity for financial institutions as well as a large expense on the books. And traditional approaches to detecting fraud have not been as accurate. Um, and can you use your machine learning and data science to allow me to detect that? Um, in the middle of the pandemic, lots of people, you know, unfortunately facing financial difficulty needed loans and they want to refinance their mortgage. And, you know, banks were not set up to get a huge influx of loan orders and mortgage requests. And can you use your machine learning products to automate the process of approving or monitoring a loan? And then can you provide assistance to the mortgage officer when these requests come in by running your, you know, your algorithms on top of it? So those are things that take you know, cloud outside of IT, but to very, very important business problems to which we're applying technology. The same thing in retail. Historically, it was about running the IT systems. Then it was about running the e-commerce systems. Then it was about re, you know, translating and transforming the in-store experience and linking that with e-commerce. But now it's about demand forecasting, improving product discovery online, helping optimize the supply chain, and applying you know, a lot of the expertise in data management, analytic processing to some of those problems. So we see a lot of this the same notion in other industries as well, applying technology, not just to traditional, you know, providing a lower cost and more agile infrastructure, but helping solve important business problems for these organizations. Yeah, uh, Thomas, as you were describing that, I thought of that <clears throat> an anecdote, I think it was 1907 or 1908. And uh, I believe whoever was in charge of the US Patent Office in the United States said, uh, okay, our work is done here. Everything that can be invented has been invented. And, uh, you know, I, I, I imagine that person did that with goodwill and all that, but we do have a tendency to think, okay, this is the end of it. But what you're describing here is really, it seems like we're just at the beginning of being able to crack open new potential and, and new ways of uh, driving business value and innovation for companies. Yes, we, we always believe, you know, we're, you're in the technology business, because you're optimistic that technology can help transform the world in a good way. And we're in the business of finding solutions to problems that companies, government agencies, and consumers have. And uh, a lot of it has you know, been accelerated because you know, if we sat down in January as we did a year ago and talked about it, nobody would have imagined the year. But that year has brought in stock relief for people how their organizations need to transform. And, uh, they recognize that the future is going to be different and you need to capture the opportunity in the future and they need platforms to help them capture that opportunity. And that's a lot of the work we're doing with our customers and partners. Tom, so just a couple more things I wanted to ask you about. One, uh, having to do with the role of the CEO. And then second, I wanted to just ask about a couple of customer um, examples here. So with the CEO, uh, again, you know, we've, uh, all had to live through this year of 2020. Everything's changed. Could you talk about from the perspective of a CEO, how has it changed your job or your outlook or your priorities? And if so, how? You know, the CEO during this period of great difficulty that people are facing, I think it comes down, for me, it has come down to two or three simple things. One, you need to keep our organization focused on helping customers. And so mission and purpose becomes a very important thing during this period. Um, you have to reiterate and reemphasize 
our mission and purpose and how it's so important to help our customers through this period. Second, I think is, you know, historically when people used to go to the office, there was an emotional connection that came from the fact that you were a team and worked together. And now we're all trying to figure out a way to recreate that team spirit, that collegiality, that, um, that emotional bond, but in a way that is different because you don't have the ability to have that physical connection anymore. In some ways, it has brought teams together that were much more geographically dispersed because now there's a greater you know, reach for these things. Um, but in other ways, we are trying to recreate that and we spend a lot of time with our teams giving people a sense of comfort, telling them to take time for themselves and helping them you know, to sort of not feel anxious as we look forward. Because I, I really do believe that we are facing a brighter future uh, because of everything we've learned through this period. So, uh, Thomas, <clears throat> Thomas, that's great. Um, two things I wanted to ask relative to customers is, I think that, uh, you know, again, it was about a year ago, you began to speak very openly, very passionately about this concept of industry specific solutions. And some people at the time would have said, what is Google Cloud doing over there? You know, Google Cloud's an infrastructure plan, so on like that. So you've described how those old barriers are, uh, they were artificial to begin with, and you just moved through them. But that has really seemed to um, spark an awakening across the industry like, businesses today don't just need the traditional horizontal applications, they need those deeper industry specific capabilities. So how is that going? It's going really well. You know, we, we are super thrilled about the work that those solutions have enabled for our customers. And I'll just give you a few examples to illustrate what I mean. You know, contact centers, very difficult during the pandemic because, you know, traditionally they had people sitting next to one another. Many of them were not designed to be able to work from from home, uh, you had huge spikes in calls into contact centers uh, because of questions, whether that's is the bank open, questions to telecommunications companies and our contact center, you know, virtual technology, the virtual agent technology is really ha you know, done an amazing job. We've handled billions of interactions this last year with that, with many, many customers. Second example, manufacturing, you know, manufacturing, uh, shop floors are very challenging during the pandemic because you do need to run the manufacturing shop floor, but you can't have employees stand next to one another because of the risk of, you know, infection. And so one of the solutions we built was a way to do visual quality inspection. And the reason that's been enormously, you know, uh, uptaking is people historically at quality control have stood at the end of the manufacturing line. Mm -hmm. very densely collected. And this allows the manufacturing line to run and using our image recognition to detect if products are good or bad and eliminates the risk to those people. Uh, we've had solutions telemedicine. We've had in public sector, for example, uh, loans and unemployment benefits and other kinds of programs uh, we've delivered through our technology platform for public service. Uh, and public sector institutions have found that's really helped them transform how they can serve citizens. So we do see the ability to adapt our platform and our capabilities to the needs of specific industries has really, because of this issue of time constraint, yeah. the, more, the faster and easier you can make your technology to, for different industries, the better you can solve their problems for them. Yeah. Um Thomas, uh, you know, great examples there. And uh, again, I think it's it's a testimony to how Google Cloud is such a radically different company than it was not so long ago. You know, you're in manufacturing shop floors, right? It might not have been the first thing that people would associate uh, with the company, but that's where the need is. That's right. And then, Thomas, I just wanted to ask, uh, I, I think your uh, announcement uh, about a year and a half ago of Anthos, uh, something too of a revolutionary product and one of those things that said we are addressing the world as it is becoming not either as we would wish or as it has been how is that being received in the market you know it's been extraordinary to see the demand for it um we are 
We have customers who deploy it on our cloud, on other clouds, in their data center, in what some people call a private cloud. We have projects going on with over 20 telecommunications companies on what's called edge cloud. And then increasingly, as we see European and other countries worried about sovereignty and digital sovereignty, which is very topical right now, it also gives people an insurance policy because you're not locked into a cloud provider. You know, and I always say, imagine if the internet, if you went back to 1996 or 97, and you said a certain set of web pages would only show up in Netscape's browser, and another set of web pages only showed up in Microsoft's browser, and a third set only showed up in Mozilla's browser, how widespread would the internet have been and how useful would it have been? And in the same thing, we see that having this more open, cross-platform programming model for cloud gives people the comfort that they can use the best technology from different providers and not be locked into a particular provider. And, in, and we've seen extraordinary interest from many, many different industries and many countries around the world. Well, Tom, that's great. Uh, it, again, I think it's one of those things that helped to spur the uh, recognition that right, some technology vendors in the past and perhaps even today feel like, if I could just keep everybody herded into my little section, everything will work. But I believe it seems like the customers have clearly taken control and, and customers expect technology vendors to adapt to what the customers need. I always found, Bob, that if you do what's right for the customer, and you help them not just where they are, but where they want to go. Like if we all look back at 2017 or 2018 and talked about multi-cloud, nobody even knew what it would have meant. Yeah. And today it's fairly standard in conversations. And it's a lot about recognizing their need, providing them the technology to solve their problem, and being there side by side with them on the journey. Because every company has a mission to serve their customers, to help you know, government agencies want to help citizens. And we've always found, provide them the best technology platform to meet that need. Um, and that is both about giving them an open platform and in places solving a specific industry problem. The more you can do that, the easier it'll be for people. And that to us, given how much challenge people have been facing this year. And as they look forward, you know, obviously we are optimistic but uh, as they look forward, there will be challenges even over the next few months. Uh, making things easy for people has always been proven to be a good recipe to help them succeed. Well, Thomas, that's perfect. Um, is there any final thought, anything you want to share before we wrap? Not at all. I wish you and your family the best for the holiday season. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak with you. Thomas, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure. Always good to see you and all the best to you and yours for the holiday season, Thomas. Thanks so Thank much. You. Right.